All right, you are all watching me. I thought you were greeting each other, and I look up, and you're all looking at me. That's good. Hey, um, great to have you here. Thank you for coming to the last service of 2013. I know there's football games and stuff going on, but you are the cool ones, <clears throat> and you are here. And I just want to say, please, uh, I'm going to preach better than what the first service responded like. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to need your help. Cindy sends her love. She, she finally caved in and got the flu that me and everybody had. And so she's home just, you know, doing that thing that she does, just chilling and resting. So she said, tell everybody. I said, hi. And I said, get up and go to church, you sinner. And, she, and then she threw a shoe at me, and that was good. No, I didn't do that. I said, don't come to church. You're going to get everybody sick. Hey, let's pray and get into the word. Father, thank you so much for how you love us, for how kind you are. And I ask Jesus for your grace and your power to be upon this message. I pray that our hearts would be open. That, Lord, there would be no distractions today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What we're going to do, uh, it's going to be kind of quick today. I, I don't have a, a ton to say. Um, but how many of you know that whenever I say that, it always means I have a ton to say? Uh, I want to do the like year, kind of a review of 2013. It was an awesome year. It was just a great year. By the way, a Christmas Eve service, we had 1,200 people here, and we had 50 salvations on that night. It was so powerful. If you missed it, it was great. It'll be online uh, pretty soon. And uh, so it was just, it was a great way to kind of end the year. So I'm going to boast in the Lord. I'm not boasting in me or Corey or Tyler or Karen O'Brien, although I love all those people and they're wonderful. How many you know without the Lord, we, we just can't do it? And so I'm going to boast in the Lord. So I, I talked to Gina Buck, who runs our food pantry, and I said, Gina, how many families did we feed last year? How many people that were hungry did we help? And she said, well, let me, let me go check that out. And so she came back and said, well, we fed 800 families last year that were hungry and in need. And I said, that is awesome. That is Jesus. That is the practical things that Jesus would do. And then, how many of you know, we, sent, we, we gave 300 boxes of food to Santa Cruz, and we gave away 1,100 toys and so I've said it before, but thank you guys for being so involved. I mean, they were blessed. It was over 300 families. They had to come in big trucks and grab all the stuff from here to take it down to the people that are in need. So thank you so much. Uh, you know we support 250 orphans, right? And this year, uh, we continued to do that. We upped our game a little bit. And so this church cares for 250 orphans in uh, Uganda. And we sent three of them through college or to help go into college this year. So um, it's kind of interesting. One of the kids was here. They brought him here. He was doing a little tour. So he was on the streets as like a 10 year old. His parents had been murdered and he was basically homeless and he came into a tent a while. He graduated and he was here and he said he was sitting across the table from me and I was listening to him and I felt like this just kept getting this impression. President, this dude's going to be the president someday. Not of our country, but of, of, uh, of Uganda. And so uh, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a dentist. And I was like, oh, way off. I'm way off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then he said, but my real dream, I want to be the president of Uganda someday. And I said, stand up. And I brought him over and we just started praying for him. Now, if he becomes the president, I don't know. Maybe he'll be presidential in his influence. We'll just, we'll just watch. He's a very, very bright young man. You're part of that. That is part of you sowing into that ministry. So thank you very much. It's a powerful thing. Our very own Pam and Rory Frank this year from this church went to Otenawa to run that orphanage. So our hand is in the middle of that. Thank God for them. Uh, some of you might not know this, but we support two churches. We support... Uh, the Santa Cruz uh, Foursquare Church, and we just started helping a church in Sacramento that's kind of a plant out of a guy's house, and we believe in this young man and what God's doing through him, and so we're giving him money every month, so we're, we're going to try to start mothering some churches and being a blessing and helping some of these churches that have great hearts. They might not have as much resource right now, and so we're going to bless them with money and prayer and conversation, and uh, so we, we got two on the dock right now that we're helping out. This year, we, just, we launched discipleship and new believers classes that have helped tremendously uh, people that have come to the Lord, because I don't want to just have people raise their hand, and then we don't do anything with them. And so now we have a discipleship class. This is interesting. We gave away $370,000 last year 
to other ministries and to missions and to outside groups to help promote the kingdom around the globe. $370,000. When Cheryl told me that, I was like, how much? Because it feels like, you know, you give a little here and give a little there. So I've already told you my goal is to give away a million dollars a year someday. So we're well and on our way. And you're part of that blessing. Thanks a lot. Um, this is a cool one. We prayed and worshipped in this sanctuary over 3,500 hours last year of just worship and prayer before the Lord. Whether it was 10 people, 2 people, 40 people, this place offered worship and praise and prayer before the Lord for 3,500 hours last year. Go and do the math and figure out, some of you are already figuring it out, how much that is in a year. So that is a powerful thing. And then here's the last one that I'm so excited about. We're just at about close to 600 salvations over 2013. 600 people coming to the Lord, raising their hand, going and getting Bibles. And, and let me just say something about that. I don't know if it's changed, but four or five years ago, the national average for churches leading people to Christ, having a convert on a Sunday morning is one a year. Isn't that terrible? That is horrific. And so I thank God that we're at that level but man, there's millions of people in our area that need Jesus. So maybe next year we'll have a thousand and we'll disciple those people. So I think you should turn to somebody that's right by you and just clap and thank them for being part of the fruit that's happening in the kingdom. So good. I'm going to give you a few quick things um, to do to end this year well and to start next year really well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. I'm going to let you finish because some of you complain that I moved too quick to the scripture, so I'm going to wait till I hear pages stopping. Matthew 5, 21. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, You've heard that it was said to those of old, in other words, those in Moses' day, you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder, whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. Interesting that the law said if someone murders, this is what should happen to them. And Jesus came and raised the bar. The standard got raised. I always say that grace is more demanding than the law. People are like, no. Grace is more demanding in that they were talking about if you murder somebody on the outside or you look at a woman and you go and commit adultery with her, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's as though you're doing it. And then he's saying here that if you're angry, that it's like murder. So he's talking about the heart. Jesus is talking about the heart. How many know you can obey laws and rules, but on the inside you're not? You ever had a teacher? Ricky, I heard this a lot. <laughs> sit down and I would sit down but on the inside I was standing up you know what I mean I'd even have that look like oh, yeah. see the law only causes that outside restraint but grace and the spirit of God when it comes into our life it changes the heart and Jesus deals with the inside of you and not just the outside of you isn't that great some of you go no that's not great it's easier to obey rules yeah but Jesus wants our hearts he's after our heart and so he's talking here about your brother and you being angry at him. And so let's uh, move on here. So you'll be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger uh, of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is talking about anger, and he's talking about unforgiveness. Has anyone in this uh, place ever been angry at somebody? Anybody? Have you ever just stewed on anger like you're nursing it on the inside like a child like a little baby you're nursing your anger have you ever been brushing your teeth and thought well if they say this I'm gonna say this and you're writing stuff down oh that's good that's good that's good I'm writing that down. 
and you're, you're, you're constantly, how do you know if you need to go and talk to a brother if you've offended them or they've offended you? How do you know that? I'll tell you how. How do you process it after the fact? So if somebody offends me, I've had people say stuff to me, and Jesus said, be careful that you're not offended too easily. How I many you know there's people that are just like, oh, oh, you can't say anything to them, or you just walk by them wrongly and they get offended. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't live your life that way. And I want to be a duck, like a duck that just the water just comes right off my back. If I get offended, there are people that say stupid stuff sometimes, and I'm like, all right. And the Lord's like, that's cool, man. Don't worry about that. And I move on, and I never think about it again. But there's other times those things just keep popping up. Yeah? You can't get rid of it. Even when you, 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 you're, you'll be in bed, and you're just about to go to sleep, and poof, you'll start thinking about that person. Look, that's when you know you have to go do business and take care of that account. That's how you know that you have a problem and there's sinful anger rising up inside of you. And here's the problem with sinful, righteous anger is good. Jesus got angry at the crowd and whipped him out of the, right, little Tai Chi on the uh, guys in the temple. He ran them off. That's righteous anger. And the Bible says be angry and don't sin. So God never says don't be angry. Anger's a human emotion. We're going to feel angry. We're going to, stuff's going to come at us. And the Lord's like, doesn't want us to be a robot. I do not feel anything. I'm a Christian. I do not feel anything. That is wrong. But it's when our anger becomes sinful. And in this case, it's, it's anger that is causeless. There was a lady uh, on the TV or on the radio yesterday. I was driving listening to this interview with this lady, I won't mention her name, but 20 years ago, she had a lot of problems. She was a big Christian person, big star, and she had some issues. And, you know, back 20 years ago, I remember thinking, well, thanks for being this way and hurting the church. And 20 years later, I'm listening to her. They're interviewing on a, on a radio show. And I went to turn it because I just went, oh, yeah, there's that lady that, you know, made us all look bad. And I went to turn it, and I literally felt what the Lord said, I want you to listen to this. So I listened to it, and then the Lord just whispered to me, you have no idea the details around that situation. You think you do, because you think you got it all figured out. Son, you have no idea what that, that family walked through. So you have causeless anger, because you heard from this person that heard from this person, and now all of a sudden there's an issue. Now, am I supposed to call this person or write this person or go to their door? And No, that would be called stalking, and we don't do that. <laughs> but just before the Lord in my car, I said, Lord, forgive me. That was wrong. I, I judged that person, and I'm sorry. You know, I've sinned too, Lord, and who am I to judge that person to hold them? See what I mean? And it's nice to have that stuff cleared out of our hearts. Because here's what anger, sinful anger does. One, it robs your relationship with God. Two, it robs your relationship with people. Because Jesus said this, if you're bringing your gift to the altar, if you're coming to church and you're going to worship, and that's a gift. Worship is a gift. And you're standing there and you realize, oh, you know, somebody has that, that, that person. Now, most of us honestly aren't going to do this for years, but some people will. They'll just for years not deal with it. And the Lord, watch this. He doesn't say, go pray about it. He doesn't say, get a prayer group together with 10 other people. I just want you guys to pray with me. Pastor Rick, I'm so mad at him. He offended me, and then we share the offense. And now we have nine other people that are offended at me or you. Have you ever had that? Someone takes up my wife. I can't tell my wife certain things. I've learned after 28 years in the ministry that I just don't tell her certain things that are going on in the church. Because here's what happens. Some guy will say something to me. This is when I was younger. I would go home and be like, honey, you should have heard what this guy said to me. And I would spout it. And she'd be like, oh. I mean, she's, you know, putting on the thing and the ghee. And she's, <laughs> you know, she's ready to go. <laughs> and then two days later, this guy comes to me and says, brother, I just, I'm sorry, man. I was in a bad mood. I was going on with my job. And I just took it out on you. And forgive me. And I hug him. And oh, I love you. And he loves me. But I never told Cindy. So for two months, every time Cindy would see this guy, she'd be like, 
start twitching and be like ready to go. And I was like, honey, what's wrong with you with that guy? And she goes, well, remember what he said to you? I go, oh, baby, like two days later, we got that all squared away. She was like, so for two months, I've been... You see, when we love someone, we want to defend someone, and the best way to defend someone is to have them be biblical. I know that person hurt you, and I know that wasn't right. Go ahead and kind of be angry and tell me all about it for a second, but then let's go do what the Bible says, and let's get that squared away so that you and that person can have a relationship with again because you're probably going to live in a mansion next door to each other in heaven. You're going to want to square this up. And here's the deal. It breaks our relationship with God. Matter of fact, the Bible says about marriage that between a husband and wife, we have to keep our relationship pure and clean and right because it actually can hinder our prayers. And I, I read that one day and thought, wow. And I love prayer. I love fellowshipping with God. I love talking with God about my issues and what I need. And there's something that I don't want. I don't want my prayers hindered because I need the Lord. And I need to pray. And he says, yeah, man, keep, your, keep you and your spouse clean. You see, the Lord cares a lot about this, this way. And he cares a lot about these relationships down here. So it doesn't say go get a prayer partner and pray about it. It literally says just go deal with it. So if somebody's ticked you off, somebody's made you angry, examine your heart and go, is it something really that's really offended me? And if it is, would you just go to that person? And you don't have to rehearse it. You don't have to say, you know, a few months ago, you know, this is what you did. And then they go, I'm sorry. And then you keep talking about, well, this is what you did. Let's just learn to forgive. And Jesus said, do it quickly. Why? Because it will put you into some kind of prison. I don't know what it is, but the one scripture says it's torment. You ever notice people that are full of anger, how they navigate their life is so different than people that aren't full of anger? I've seen people that are angry for 30 years at somebody, and literally on their face you can see it. Their wrinkles say, I'm angry. You ever been uh, offended by somebody, and then you stew about it, and you see them two years later, and they see you and they're like, hey, and they hug you. Oh, it's so good to see you. And then you go, bro, I got to talk to you, man. Remember you offended me like two years ago? You... And they're like, I, I offended you? I didn't know I offended you. And then you feel stupid because you've been carrying it around for two years and they don't even remember. That's why it's good before the Lord just to get that stuff out. And you don't have to resolve everything, but just go and say, look. And you may never be friends with that person. See, forgiveness is not just going back to that person that abused you and hurt you and, and, and getting back in a relationship with them. Forgiveness is simply saying, I forgive you for what you've done. It doesn't mean I'm going to subject, subject myself back to your abuse. Right? Jesus doesn't say, hey, lady that's getting beat by your husband, forgive. And just keep going back and be a punching bag. It's not. Jesus would never say that. He would say, forgive and then leave that guy until he gets help and gets figured out. Amen, ladies? There's not enough ladies amen in right now. <laughs> if your man's beating you, man. You got to tell him, see ya, until you get help and you get whole before the Lord. Because I'm not going to submit myself before that. So I don't know why I just said that, but maybe there's somebody in here that's being hit and you need to get help. So you don't need to, you don't need to clap. It's all good. All right. So get that stuff resolved and, and be clean. Now, here's three things I want us to commit to in the year 2014, in our private life, in the church's life, in, our, in, in us as East Bay Foursquare. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. I love this verse because it's easy. You don't have to get the Greek out and study it and be like, what are they trying to say? It's so simple. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. It's pretty easy, right? No, not really. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. Wow. I always think, did you get that one wrong? Was that, is that really what you meant? Rejoice always? I'm going to tell on myself. I was driving. And how, it seems like I'm always driving when I tell you these stories, but... I was coming on, um, uh, this was just the day after Christmas, I was by myself, came over the freeway there, you know, and getting left to go down to the 680 to go to Dublin, and I'm in my car, and I'm coming on, and 
uh, you know, they have that little, there's like the, those little embankment things they've put in there, they're doing work, and I'm driving, and I don't know about you, but when I drive, I don't just stare in one place, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, what's my next move. So I look in my little mirror, and from being from Los Angeles, I completely forgot you shouldn't do this, because in LA, you wear sunglasses when you drive, and you never look in your mirror like this, because somebody will see that, and they'll, woo, they'll pull right in and block you. So you always... You always just drive, and you look with your eyes. You never turn your head. You look with your eyes, and then when there's a hole, you get in. You poof. So I'm in beautiful Danville. I've forgotten this technique, and uh, I looked in my mirror, and I didn't have my sunglasses on, and there was a lady coming, and she saw me look at her, and then she punched it. I heard her engine just whoop, whoop. <clears throat> now think about it. There's her. Here's me. Right? I'm coming. She's like right here. There's a semi truck behind her. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not taking on that semi truck. So my Ford Explorer with the 300 horsepower. I pet her every now and again. And, just, and I just stuck my foot in it. I mean, it was great. <laughs> whoa, whoa, and I just... Whoa, Pastor her gut in front of her. And then I did this. <laughs> like, what are you doing? You crazy late. That's what I'm starting to get a little riled up. And I go down the road another 500 yards, and this other guy almost cuts me off. And I'm starting to get irritated. And I'm thinking about rejoice always. <laughs> it doesn't say except when you're driving. So I literally thought, what is wrong with me? Why am I so aggressive? I literally said it out loud. Lord, why am I so aggressive right now? Am I frustrated? Is there something going on inside of me? Because I'm pretty aggressive. And the Lord just whispered, just be thankful and rejoice. Just rejoice. Just stop for a minute and think about who you are in me, what I've done for you, the cross, eternity, forgiveness. And I started just to rejoice. And by the time I got to Dublin, I I felt good. Rejoicing is a huge part. It's basically this. It takes the burden out of service, I think. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength, right? Nehemiah says the joy of the Lord. What is your strength? Wow. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, man, what's wrong with me, Lord? I'm not really joyful right now. What's going on? There's a disconnect. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of serving the church, the joy of being a husband, the joy of being a father, you, the joy of being a mother, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because how many know sometimes you just, your kids take you off, man? And there's a, there's a sound in your house. Have you ever woke up in the morning and you're just five minutes into your day and you hear some conversation in your house and you go, uh-oh, it's, it could be a tough day. Anybody ever thought that? You know what I do? As the man of that house, as the father of that house, I don't go downstairs and rebuke my son. That's what I do. Upstairs in my house, I just pray. And I just just start worshiping God. I literally start to just thank God for who he is. And I just ask the Lord, come fill our home with your presence, God. It's powerful. Worship, rejoicing, it's all about worship. Worship is huge. I've preached in churches, in conferences. I've preached in many churches where there was the worship beforehand never got off the ground. You know what I mean? Like people just kind of, and it wasn't really that great. And people were just, and I've actually come and said, hey, band, can we, can we worship a little bit? And people are like, well, we just, we just, we just worshiped. And I go, no, no, we sang. We sang. We sang. We didn't worship. And we'll worship, and it's amazing what happens. Poof. Worship changes the atmosphere. When I start thanking in God and song, watch. The Bible says to sing to one another with with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Watch. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. I'm supposed to make melody in my heart. How many don't sing very well? Come on. He still likes it. Even if it's flat. 
Like if you're in the key of G and then you're in the key of E, the key of G and the key of D, and you're, he doesn't care. He loves it. Making melody in our heart, it's not just something that's put in the Bible it, so that it can sound nice. It's literally a spiritual principle. Our worship determines our altitude a lot of times. And I'm supposed to be a man that's before the Lord making melody in my heart. My family gets tired of it because I will start the morning and I sing all day long. And if I don't sing, I literally will ask the Lord, what is going on with me? But my son will say, Dad, stop, stop. I don't even realize I'm doing it. I'm coming down the stairs, right? We will stop and give me praise. And I got the little Tupperware. And, I'm, and, and they're like, what are you doing? I go, I'm happy. I'm happy. It's okay. I'm rejoicing in what God has done. My song fills the atmosphere and the Lord digs it. We're supposed to be a, ch- a church that rejoices always. Just, just sing and worship. And worship him in the worst. They worshiped God in a prison. Paul and Silas chained to a wall. You believe that? All they're doing is helping people and they're in prison. You ever feel like you're doing the right thing and you're getting put in prison? Stuff, bad things keep happening? You know what they did? They just started worshiping the Lord. Could you imagine? They're like, hey, what do you want to do, Paul? Well, you know, we're, we're here. We got some time. Why don't we just uh, sing some songs before the Lord? And I don't know what song they sang back then. I don't know what the hot, great K-Love hits were. but (laughs) They started to sing, and the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's footstool. And the father heard his children singing, and he probably started tapping his foot, and that's what caused the earthquake that set him free from that prison. (laughs) We just want to rejoice. I want a worshiping church. I don't want a singing church. I can go to a Justin Bieber concert and sing. And by the way, come out completely unchanged. Maybe a little less pride in my life. <laughs> but there's a guy, I read a book, and he was 40 years ago, and he said, my concern for the church is that it's basically going to become a church where um, it's all about pleasing the congregation. And I've told you before that we've left... We've left altar ministry in the Western culture for platform ministry. Who's on the stage? How good is it? How great is the stage? And for thousands of years, people came to church to meet with God. They came to the altar to meet with God. But now it's, I don't like the preaching, or I love the preaching, or I don't like the music, or I love the music. And I've been in churches, and guys, look, I like technology. I like green lights, and I like lasers and smoke, and all that stuff. It's kind of cool, but I don't need it to have a relationship with God. And I fear that in in the Western culture, we've created an atmosphere where I've been in large churches that have killer, it's amazing. It's like being at a rock show. And I spent two songs just going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I mean, all the guys were in sync doing stuff, and you know, they're... And the guy's shredding, and I'm going, wow, this is great. And, I'm, and for two songs, and I realized, I'm not even worshiping God right now. I'm just amazed at that. And I, that's part of it. God gives us talents, and it's an excellent and skillful thing. I get it. I'm for it. But literally, I turned around to watch what the, the church was doing. Guess what they were doing? Nothing. They weren't even singing. They were just like this. And I said, Lord, this is what we're talking about. We've turned this into a show. And people aren't getting transformed anymore. They're getting information. And they're, they're, they're judges judging the service. How cold was it? How hot was it? How soft were the chairs? Was the coffee good? Were the ushers on time? Was the preaching good? And worship was good. And this was good. And then we leave and we've kind of measured it up. And then we go to the next church and, and we judge it and we do da 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 da. And then we say, well, this church is really good and this church isn't so good. And I go, ugh, I'm not sure I want to measure things on that ground. Let me, I'm going to say it one more time. Those things are good and God's anointing them. He does anoint that. But we want to be a church. I'm just saying what we're going to be. We're going to be a church where when we come into this place, we're going to rejoice and sing before the Lord and worship the Lord. Amen? All right, good. It's kind of quiet. Kind of quiet. Two, you already know this, and I don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but we're going to be a praying church. 
I've talked to you about prayer for a year, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but he says, pray without ceasing. And I first read that as a teenager and thought, so I would just walk around town like praying all the time. You know, oh, Father God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Under my breath, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing. People say, what are you doing? You're talking to yourself? No, I'm praying without ceasing. Thank God for old men that were in my life that said, buddy, that's not what, that's not what that verse means. Here's what it means. It doesn't mean mumbling prayers all day. It means staying connected to the Lord, being ready to pray. It's like this. When we're on the phone, remember the old phones. This is the old phones, right? Some of you kids will not know what we're talking about. <laughs> when you would pick that phone up off that receiver and be like, hello, and then you would talk, and then you would hang it up. Here's what prayer is. I give my life to Jesus. Hello. And he's like, can you hear me now? And I'm like, I got you. Now, this is what prayer is. I don't put that receiver back on the wall. I lay it down and leave the line open. It's the constant conversation that never stops. I've been in prayer meetings where people are like, amen, at the end. And then I'll go, wait, 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 wait. I, I forgot. I want to pray about something. And they're like, okay, Lord, it's us again. Sorry for hanging up on you. You know what I mean? We said amen, and it means we're done. It doesn't, amen just means so be it. See, in my life, I look at prayer, of course, has carved out moments where I just want to come and be with the Lord in the prayer room or in my home. But then I also see prayer as a constant dialogue in the background of my life. It's constant. So I'm in the car, driving along, I'm thinking, and all of a sudden the Lord will put somebody's picture in my mind from the church. This happens all the time. Somebody's face, I don't even know their name. And I'll just say, Lord, touch them today. Or I'll just be in my car and I'll just say it out loud. I'm, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Boom. Drive, another 20 minutes. Lord, thank you for my wife. Gosh, that's great. How cool are you that I don't have to live alone? Thank you so much. Lord, thank you for EBF. You see, when we have a constant connection with the Lord, we're not, we're not unsaved and saved depending upon our prayer life. When we are saved and brought into the kingdom, our, our life is a prayer. It is constant in that way. And he's saying pray without ceasing. In the early church, prayer is what they did in the book of Acts. For thousands of years, that's what churches have done. I've actually watched video of underground churches that are in communist countries. Mind-blowing. I watched 300, um, I don't know exactly what country it was. It was a communist country where they literally were in a cave and a guy comes walking in with his camera and these 300 people cried out. I don't mean, I'm, I'm not talking about just... I'm talking weeping, desperation on their faces. And I saw this camera, and I, I said to the guy, how long did that go on for? And he said, three hours. Every morning that cave at four o'clock has two to 300 people in it praying. And I thought, wow, see, they're desperate and they know it. We're desperate, but I don't think we quite understand it sometimes. Because prosperity, listen to me, prosperity without desperation actually can drive us away from our relationship with God. But prosperity and still understanding our need, blessed are those who mourn, right? We still understand our need. It actually, that prosperity is 10 times better when we're before the Lord understanding that we're just dust and without him we don't have much, right? So we're going to be a church that prays without, we're going to keep that dialogue going in the prayer room and in our personal lives. We're going to have a life of, of prayer. The next one, it says this, be thankful in all things. If you have a problem being thankful, raise your hand. I'm going to just be honest. Yeah, I, I, 10 years ago, I was like an Eeyore a little bit. I would just be kind of like, oh, well, we can't do it Nobody likes me. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. Oh, this isn't going to work. Eeyore. The more time I spend in the presence of the Lord. I used to go into a rabbit hole for two weeks like that. Just, oh, geez. Now when I sense that even starting in my life, I literally will, I, I war with that thing with thankfulness. 
Because the reason why we're negative is because we don't understand how good our God is and how powerful he is. And I'll just start thanking God. Lord, I thank you so much. You are good. You're going to see us through this. God, thank you for what you're doing. See, thankfulness is the key. Here's the deal, though. It doesn't say, give thanks for all things. It's not what the... I've, I've, I've heard guys preach, you got to be thankful for that cancer. Where'd you get that? Let me look in that verse again. What does it say? Let, let's just make sure we're there. In everything, give thanks. It doesn't say for everything, give thanks. In it. Why do we give thanks in the midst of the storm? Because we understand that the storm may actually be producing gold in us. And that God's forming life. Look right here. I want you to hear this. It's not be thankful for cancer. Be thankful for uh, the car accident that kills your brother. People, it's weird. We don't, we don't do it. We are thankful in that thing, not for it. You think God's in heaven going, yeah, I gave them cancer. Let's see how they respond to that. No, we live in a fallen, broken world and stuff happens. But in that, in that, in the season, whether it's a good season or a, a we, what we look at as a bad season, in it, I'm going to be thankful because I know that my God isn't asleep at the wheel and he knows how to help me. So I'm going to be thankful in it. Lord, I thank you that in this battle, in this hard time that I'm going through, that you're going to use it for good in my life. I'm so thankful that you're not asleep at the wheel. Praise your name. And you'll watch your altitude start to change. But if you're, I, 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 just, I just do not believe in thanking God for bad things. Jesus came, and by his stripes we were healed. He overcame sickness and death. Why would he then just throw it on us, right? He's the healer, and he can heal us, and so we're going to contend for that. So we're going to be, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. One person, one person's happy. We're going to be thankful in everything. So here's three things we're going to do. Oh, it's, it's not, it's not uh, anything you haven't heard me say before, but we need to be right. We're going to rejoice and be worshipers of God. We're going to pray and seek the Lord's face, and we're going to be a thankful house. We're going to be a thankful place as a church and as a people. One last thing I want to share with you and write this down. I want you to be ready this year for what God wants to do in 2014. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, the disciples had just come, or the Pharisees had just come to Jesus and asked them why they're your disciples don't fast like everybody else, and he's responding to that question. And he says, can the, fr- can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, and the wine is spilt, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So look at this. Here's two things Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about the law. He was saying, you guys, you Pharisees, you want the law to be the package that all this is going to come in. And I'm saying to you that this is a new thing that I'm doing. It's not going to fit into your world. And then so he he tells them, look, here's the deal. When I go away, my disciples are going to fast. And then he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else they'll break and they'll both be ruined. So here's what Jesus cares about. Look right here. Jesus cares about wineskins and he cares about wine. And I don't mean that in the natural. You're his wineskin. He cares about you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when he pours out what he's going to do, the new thing that he's going to do in the earth, we have to be wineskins that are prepared to receive it. We can't be old wineskins. By the way, old wineskins isn't an age thing. I know 20-year-olds that are old wineskins. They want God to do what they think he should do, and they want revival to look like what they think revival should look like. And I'm saying to you, have you ever seen an old wineskin, how they actually refurbish it and get it prepared for wine again? They take it, they dunk it in a river, And they leave it there. And then they pull it out and they take a rock and they lay it on another rock and they beat on it with a rock. And I'm like, I don't want to have that happen to me. (laughs) Lord, hold me down a little bit in the river of life, but let's not do the rock thing. (laughs) And then the Lord says, then you just be pliable in my presence. You be pliable before me. You see, 
then that thing can hold new wine. And I say to you, I don't ever want to lose, and I pray that you do too, I don't ever want to lose the ability just to say, God be God, do what you want. I just heard this. A brother was telling me that he ran into somebody who used to go to the church a year ago. And uh, he said, bro, I haven't seen you around. He goes, yeah, I don't go there anymore. And he says, well, why? And he says, well, you know, that pastor, he changed the name of the church, so I left. Change the whole name. Right? Still the same EBF, still East Bay. Here's the funny thing. I said after I walked away from that conversation, Lord, how are we ever going to experience a revival in this country when we leave churches and get sideways over things like that? I don't care if you call this church Bob's House of Fun. I don't. Now, I believe there's prophetic things about names and God uses those things. But look, I'm more concerned about what's going on the inside of my church than the sign that's out on the front. You see, we can become old wineskins where we're so in love with yesterday that we have no vision for tomorrow. Look, yesterday's gone. It was sweet when I got saved at 15 and I listened to John Michael Talbot in my closet. If you don't know what that is, he's a monk that played an acoustic guitar. Oh, and I would pray and be with the Lord. Or the songs that they sang when I was 17 in the church when I first got saved that I was so attached to that when the new ones came along, I was like, what is this song? I want to sing the old ones. And the Lord's like, dude, you're getting a little bit rigid. Here comes the rock. So we're just going to be ready as a church to say, come Lord Jesus and have your way. And as long as we stay within the bumpers of the Bible and we don't go off dirt roads that the Lord didn't ask us to go down and things that aren't even scriptural, as long as we stay within the, the word of God and we let the Holy Spirit do what he wants, guys, there's nothing, there's nothing that God can't do through us if we would be willing to say, I lay it all down. I just want you to have your way, Jesus, whatever you want to do. I don't care. Until we come to the point in our life where Jesus is all we want, it's very difficult. And I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to end with this little story, and I'm not boasting in this. I'm literally saying this happened to me. When we left our church in Colorado, burnt out, tired, bewildered, we knew the Lord said go. We didn't know what in the world was going on. And we were sitting out literally in Palm Desert. And I remember one morning I walked out to the down this path to this swimming pool where you could sit in these tables. I had my Bible, and I, I just set my Bible down, and I was like, I don't know what you're doing, Lord. You're, you're, this is crazy. And then this overwhelming desire came over me that I just said to the Lord, whatever you want to do with me is fine with me. I don't care. Jesus, if you want me, and I meant it, if you want me to go be a janitor at a church, I will do it. I will be the best janitor the world has ever seen. Just don't ask me to paint because you know I'm not skilled. (laughs) But I said to the Lord, I don't care. I'll do whatever. I just want to please you. I just want to know you. I just want to love you. I don't care. I'll be a janitor. Lord, I'll I'll deliver the big water thing. Do you know the water to people's houses? I'll just deliver. I'll do whatever. When that day, that moment comes upon you, it's so freeing because you understand it's not about the prestige and the place and the stuff. It's about loving God and being a wineskin that says, whatever you want to pour into me, pour into me. However you want to use this old bag. Boy, don't say that to your wife. That would be the wrong thing to say. (laughs) However you want to use this, I am the clay and you are the potter. And I can't say to you, why did you make me this way and why would you do this? You just have me. Just whatever you want to do. Amen? It's so good. It'll set you free. It'll set you free. You'll just be like, yeah. Rejoice, pray, and be thankful. It's pretty easy, really, but pretty hard. The only way we're going to live that life is by the grace of God. It's not going to be because we will to. It's going to be by the grace of God. Let's be a great church that says, 
Come on, Lord, pour the new wine into us. Do whatever you want to do. However it looks, we're cool with it. Amen? Does, hey, listen, some of us think revival's going to look like this, and revival's going to look like this church, and what's going on over here, and what's going on over there. When, when we have revival in this church, that's what it's going to look like. I had a person tell me one time, we don't have enough of this going on in the church. And I thought, hmm, so explain that to me. Well, you know, we're just this and that, and they started talking about it, and I said, almost 600 people came to Jesus last year. Oh, that's nice, but we need this and this and this to be happening. And I go, stop, 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 stop. The greatest miracle that can ever happen happened 600 times. A person can be healed from cancer and still not know Jesus and go to hell. Now, do I want, I believe, I've already told you what the Lord told me in the dream with the, and the lady and the confirmations come in that we're going to be a house where people get healed physically. It's going to be powerful. But you guys, we've got to have our eyes open to what the Lord is doing. 800 families were fed. Jesus would say, well done, go, that's good. And there are people that say, no, we need just the spiritual stuff. And I go, I want the spiritual stuff. But we can't just say we're all spiritual and we're not practical in our lives and helping the poor and helping those who have need. Jesus talked about it. He said, you say you prophesied and you've cast out demons and you've done all these things, but you haven't loved the guy in prison and you haven't loved the widow and you haven't taken care of the orphan. So what does that mean? Oh, we shouldn't prophesy, we shouldn't cast out demons? That's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying it's both. The new wine might not look exactly what you think it should look like. What I'm going to do in this season, I'm going to come and I'm, going to, I'm the pruner of the vine. I'm going to come and prune that place in your life that used to produce so much fruit for God. And then he comes along and goes, whack. And you go, hey, why'd you do that? And he goes, because next year you're going to produce fruit. It's just going to look a little different. And it's going to be good fruit. I've been to Wente. I look at those vineyards out there. They're gorgeous sometimes. I was out there not too long ago, and I literally just stood, and I said, this is disgusting. They're ugly. They're just, just this log of thing with no nothing. And then you go talk to the guy who takes care of those, and he goes, oh, that's exactly what they should look like right now. It's perfect. And see, in your life, you're, there's things that are messed up, and oh, I'm offended here, and I don't know what's going on here. I'm offended with God. Why aren't you helping me? And the Lord goes, you, you look perfect. You're right where I want you. I am? I look kind of dorky. And he's like, no, you're perfect. Because now if you'll just hang in there, man, here comes fruit. Here comes fruit. God's going to produce fruit in your life and in the kingdom. Yeah? It's going to be great. Depending on how we respond. Let's pray. I just want to quickly give time for people that maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. You've never invited him into your life. I, I just love God. I, I, I just love how good he is that he would actually bring you to a church where you have the opportunity to say yes to him. He loves you with an amazing love and he wants to come into your heart and save you. That's what it says. Call on the Lord and you'll be saved. If you're here and you want to do that today, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to respond by saying yes to him, all I want you to do, I'm just going to be moving my head across this audience. If you would say, I need Jesus in my life, would you just raise your hand up so I can see? I'm just going to agree with you. Say, man, I need the Lord in my life. He's good and I want him. I'm just going to come quickly. We're not going to belabor this. If that's you and you need the Lord in your life today, we're just coming through. I'm all the way over here now, way over on the left. If you would say, yeah, pray for me, man. I need Jesus in my life. Good. Just invite him in right where you're sitting. Just say, Jesus, come. Come into my life. Forgive me. Help me. Father, I'm asking you today, I stand before you, committing 2014 to you, thanking you for, for 2013. May it be under the blood of Jesus. And Father, I'm thanking you for a fresh year that's come upon us, and I ask that it would be a year of prayer, a year of intimacy with Jesus. Father, a year where our hearts are thankful and we rejoice by the power of the Holy Spirit, not some human emotion. 
that you would grace us, Lord. I pray for East Bay Foursquare Church to fulfill its destiny, to be what you've asked it to be, to do what you've called us to do. Lord, may we not get sidetracked or out in any way out of, out of your will and your way for us, but may we stay true to the calling. I pray for every family here that 2014 would be a great year that you would break sickness in the name of Jesus off of families, that you would break emotional issues, even mental issues, that you would heal them, Father. I'm asking God that you would, that you would bring financial blessing, that you would break the curse of debt and trouble off of people's lives, that this would be an amazing year of seeing your hand. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, in 2014, we're starting the year off. Uh, we're going to be going through the book of Romans on Sunday mornings uh, for, for 14 weeks. Yep, we're going to go through it. It's called uh, Romans Uncensored is the title of the message because there's stuff in Romans that people don't want to talk about. and We're going to talk about it. Uh, so for 14 weeks, we're going to be in the book of Romans. Don't miss it. It's life changing. There are actually principles in Romans that if you don't understand, you will live a defeated Christian life. You will just live kind of beneath your privilege as a child of God. So let's stand together. Let's end this day with some worship. I know some of you are thinking, get out to the car so we can beat the traffic. Let's worship the Lord as loud and as hard as we can. <laughs>